Hey guys, we are back once again with Why the Pros Play. With games of equal sizes having nowhere near the amount of money that CCL is putting into this tournament, I think it's about time to bring back Why the Pros Play. I'm looking at other games like uh, Super Smash Brothers, and I'm just going, okay, the people that they're calling pros in that game um, are not even making the bottom amount of money that the 8th place teams are going to be making in CCL. So I figured it was definitely time to bring that back. And who better to bring that back with main tank Uther. Now I've mentioned that I think that Uther is going to see a spot in all levels of competitive play. Ever since they changed and buffed some of his builds, I think that W build Uther is a dominant force for a healer. I think especially in the competitive scenes since it's going to be so common that we're going to be seeing burst comps, blow up comps, everything like that, and Uther can give that armor, allowing people to survive a lot of those burst comps. With that being said, though, we are seeing main tank Uther, and this is a question that I get asked a lot. Why are the high level competitive players playing main tank Uther? And why did we see so many nerfs to main tank Uther? And that is where I'm going to break it down into three major reasons. The number one reason why a lot of strange picks like supports in the solo lane and supports in the, the tank position um, is because of double support. Supports in Heroes of the Storm have always been rather strong. They heal a lot more than healers in League of Legends do. Um, they have a lot more potential as far as just pure numbers of keeping people back up. People kill at a slower rate in Heroes of the Storm than places, again, like League of Legends or Dota, which makes it to where healers are extraordinarily valuable in this game. Having two healers makes it to where one healer can cover one type of healing and another healer can cover another type of healing. Or you can utilize a healer for the high CC output that they have and then another healer for another reason. Two of the most common healers used in double support is Uther and Ana, And the first reason is because Uther can play another role. He can play a main tank. And Ana um, can cover some of that sustained healing, but she kind of struggles with burst healing. So it allows you to handle both the burst healing and the sustained healing. It allows you to handle very long fights on maps like Volskaya on maps like potentially Braxis Holdout, and any other map that is going to have a really long, drawn-out fight. And that is the number one reason for running Uther main tank, is that double support is so strong. And being able to force double support is great, and being able to use double support without losing a damage roll is even better. The secondary reason why you want to be running main tank Uther is because the amount of armor that he gives to the team. Um, main tank Uther can give a lot of armor and it can be a really, really great tool where if you're playing main healer Uther, yes, you can still give that armor, but you kind of have to use your abilities more to, to heal people. Where, as a main tank, you can save your abilities purely for the preventative measures of giving armor to a target that gets hit by a CC, or giving armor to a target uh, before they're about to take a lot of burst damage. And finally, the last reason why you'd want to go main tank Uther over another tank or another healer in the main tank role is because of his point and click stun, as well as his multiple stuns. So not only does he have some of the easiest stuns to land in the game, but he also has some of the longest stun lock potential in the game as well, allowing him to stun lock a target for 3.75 seconds, which is higher than most other tanks in the game. I, I believe it's outside of like Mosh or Rewind, it is the highest stun lock in the game and he can do it as early as level 16. So for those three reasons, it makes Uther main tank a very valuable part to any team comp that can utilize either the extra healer, the extra armor, the different types of healing, um, or that point and click stun, or just again those stun chains. Now that we know why the pros play it, 
let's see how they utilize this main tank Uther. So with this being said, this is a CCL match. We've got two teams of pro players. We've got Wildheart versus Granite Gaming. Wildheart is made primarily of competitive North American players with people like Zergling, who is on um, Scythe Esports at the end of uh, HGC. We have Pitkid, who's actually Justing, uh, one of my favorite drafters in the entirety of HGC. I think that he comes up with the coolest drafts, just like what we're seeing right now. Um, and then we also have people like Funs and Unaverted who are dominant in the open division as well as the competitive scene outside of HEC. And we have Buds who is on... Uh, but wait, Buds was on Octalysis as well with Justing, if I remember correctly. On the opposing team, we have three members of Granite Gaming with Henning, Swamp Groot, and Skog. And then Nick was uh, an open player, as well as Nintori, who was an open division player. Actually, uh, Nintori was partnered with Zergling on Scythe Esports at the end of it. So this these teams are filled with old HGC pros, as well as new CCL pros, which is awesome. We get to see a little bit of the old, a little bit of the new, and we get to see some new meta come into this as well. Uh, these players are playing extraordinarily seriously, and... One of the things that you're going to notice about Main Tank Uther is how far he plays back. Because Uther has received numerous health nerfs, uh, he can't really step up as much as some of the other main tanks. He has less health than even many bruisers. So uh, in this particular game, D.Va is going to have about as much tankiness as this Uther will have. The only reason that, that Uther will have possibly more tankiness is because he's going to oftentimes have um a a 25 armor on him because he's going to be healing himself every time that he uses holy shock and so while he's going to be playing safer let's talk a little bit about his build he takes silver touch the primary reason for taking silver touch is to increase the range and reduce the mana cost down to 40. Um, and the whole purpose of reducing the mana cost down to 40 is that he can stay in fights longer. Remember, when you run double healer, you generally can take the longer fights because you can out-sustain the opposing team. Well, you can't do that if you run out of mana, which is something that Uther really struggles with. So by reducing the cost of his Q down to, or his Holy Light anyways, down to 40, not only can he effectively cast Q at half the mana, but he's actually going to be able to gain more mana back than what he spends on it because of the talent he takes. And also, I just want to point out, this was clean. The enemies got the camp, he stunned them, and then he stole the, the turret and just placed the turret down before he, uh, before he got knocked away. It's enough for them to, uh, to do quite a bit to Skog. So at level 4, he's taking Holy Shock, which makes it to where you can use your Q on an enemy. You, get, you still get the healing from the Q, but what you also get from this Q is that you will get back 45 mana and you cut the cooldown in half. Which means now you can heal yourself every 6 seconds and you can apply armor to yourself every um, or, or for one third of the time. So you're going to have a higher effective health one third of this game because of these two talents right here. And every time you're gonna gain 45 mana back after spending 40 mana, which means you're gonna effectively be gaining five mana every time that you cast your Q. Level seven, he goes with a talent that's not normally picked in uh, as far as a main tank, and that is Guardian of Ancient Kings. I really like this talent as a main healer because oftentimes you're going to throw a heal out on targets to get CC'd. That 50 armor is going to guarantee that that target stays alive, or at least it's going to be really easy for him to stay alive. Where Cleanse not always saves the target because if everyone's going to throw abilities at the target that gets CC'd, the, the Cleanse, they're still going to take that full amount of damage. Not only that, but Cleanse can only affect one person, where the Spear from Imperius will only really kill a target if it hits two people or if the whole team's ready to follow up the Spear. But if he does hit two people, he can almost kill people without his team. So Guardian the Ancient Kings allows him to... Um, Grant armor to the team that gets hit, the, the team members that get hit by the spear, regardless of how many people get hit by the spear. Level 10, he takes Divine Storm. Whether you're main tank or main healer, there is potential for Divine Shield, but in this particular case, the nano boost is going to be most likely going to Mephisto, who doesn't need that shield. And 
So instead, he ends up going with Divine Storm. And again, you can stun an entire team for 1.75 seconds. And you combine that with your one second stun on Hammer of Justice, potentially the two one second stuns with Benediction. And you've got yourself that 3.75 seconds of CC that you can apply. Level 13, he takes Well Met to reduce the damage and movement speed of whoever he stuns. So after the couple stuns, there's no way they're going to be able to get out of that. I personally recommend other talents at 13 purely because I've done some numbers in the competitive scene that I've seen. And usually the target that you're going to be stunning is going to die. Um, and if they don't die, then this talent isn't going to help you as much as you would hope. Um, where Spell Shield and Blessed Champion can make you a lot tankier. Uh, Spell Shield makes you a little bit tankier against Burst, where Blessed Champion makes you have a little bit more survivability in long fights. But, I digress. This is a team that knows quite a bit about this competitive environment, and they know how to adjust their comp accordingly. And so that's something that uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're right. We'll see. And then finally, 16, we see that Benediction, and level 20, we'll be seeing the upgrade to the ult, and we'll be seeing that Divine Hurricane, uh, increasing the radius and reducing the cooldown. So now that we know what the build is that he's going to be going, and we know how he plays in the early game, he's playing rather safe, he's poking with his Q, he's getting himself armor. What makes this actually good? Because as it stands... It looks like Wildheart is getting absolutely trashed, right? They are down a fort. They have not done a single fort on the opposing team. They're down three kills. They're down a full level lead. A little bit more than a full level lead. And what is even going to make this good? Well, when you're playing a, a comp like this in the competitive environment, so much comes down to that coordination right and if you can set up for your team anything is possible what we see i mean great cleanse self cleanse by by unaverted right there made sure that barrel didn't do anything but that's unfortunate because it's a medallion out of the way um but what we're going to be seeing is once they begin calling the targets they actually want to kill um they're going to be able to do something that you don't normally see happen from a lot of the teams in maybe um well, especially in Storm League, but also in Nexus Gaming Series and Heroes Lounge. And that level of coordination that we're going to be able to see is going to be the reason why they run this. It's because stunning someone for three seconds in a row or more is enough to set up for nearly anything in this game. Let's say you stun someone for even two seconds in a row and you get the full amount of damage coming out from micro missiles. Well, that's enough damage to 100 to 0 a Tracer or a Junkrat. You get three stuns in a row, and you get a couple free attacks off of Hanzo. And that, again, is a lot. But there are a lot of cases where these stuns will set up for things like Durance of Hate. Well, we recently saw that buff coming out from Durance of Hate on level 20. Right? That unspeakable horror buff. And that can silence for up to 5.5 seconds. And so silencing a team for anywhere from five or from three to five and a half seconds is crazy powerful. The problem is, is Unspeakable Horror is a very slow channel and slow moving ability that is difficult to land. So what'll end up happening is if he can stun lock a team long enough for Unspeakable Horror to go off, well then guess what? They're all rooted for long enough for Dragon Strike to go off. And that's all that their team comp actually needs. Is just stuns long enough for Durance to work, and then and then uh, Durance long enough for Dragon Strike to work. And they can beat just about any team if that works the way that they drafted this comp to work. You might be saying, well... Why didn't they just run Varian? He can taunt, and then Durance goes out. Well, everyone walks away from the taunt to target in that case. See, he can stun the first target, and as Durance starts being casted, he can AoE stun the rest of the targets and have the Durance hit the rest of the people. And that's where this draft gets really interesting. Um, we have a Nano onto Uther. Again, more potential stuns, but most likely that's not the target they wanted to Nano. They usually Nano the, the Mephisto. 
And so that's the major reason why they're running Uther over something like uh, Varian. Now you could say that uh, Garrosh plays a lot of the same roles, because Garrosh can stun everyone for two seconds with taunt, potentially throw one target into position so that they get hit by Durin's. Um, but it is a little bit more difficult to pull off, and Garrosh has his struggles as well. The later the game goes on, Garrosh loses a lot of his survivability, and against someone like an Imperius, Garrosh will have a hard time dealing with it, because if Imperius jumps um, and stuns a bunch of people, you have to use your Unstoppable a little early, um, where all Uther has to do is step away and give everyone on his team armor so they can survive. So this allows this comp to have their entire team survive burst where they otherwise wouldn't. And that is why Uther main tank is so powerful. So with that being said, I'm just going to go through and talk about the rest of the game rather than why people are running main tank Uther. Um, I can mention a little bit. Uh, if you guys are in uh, Nexus Gaming Series or in Heroes Lounge and you're wondering how to utilize main tank Uther for your team, just think about team comps that um, could could follow up about two to three seconds of stun. If you have a team comp that can follow up two to three seconds of stun, um, then that's the start of building a team comp around main tank Uther. The next thing would be... Um, Look for maps where people have to walk into you. Main tank Uther has no gap closers. He has no increase of movement speed. So you need to make sure that you're playing main tank Uther into a, a map where enemies have to walk to you or else you're never catching up to people. And then finally, if you're going to draft main tank Uther, um, it's a great counter to teams that like to run burst that's followed up by any form of CC. Uh, and if you can match those criteria, Main Tank Uther is a great pickup for teams in Heroes Lounge and, uh, and Nexus Gaming Series. And again, I would recommend modeling off of Justing's playstyle. Because if you model off of Justing's playstyle, you are going to have safer games, you're going to have better results on average, you're going to be able to keep your team alive through burst, and you're not going to die endlessly. One of the biggest issues I would say fighting into a main tank Uther is uh, is Garrosh. Um, you have no escape on main tank Uther, and Garrosh can simply throw you and get a kill every single time. So just be careful if you are playing into a Garrosh and main tank Uther, because you will definitely struggle into Garrosh. He throws, you die very quickly, even into non-burst comps if you're CC'd. Now, if you die, it's not the end of the world. You still have your trait, which is something that's very underrated with main tank Uther because people do want to kill you pretty early into the fight, but if they kill you early into the fight, you actually have more healing and more potential to give armor to your team. And so that's the one thing that can throw people off. If they spend way too many resources killing you, it could actually be a really bad thing. Especially if they're really focusing to, on killing you, you could potentially take Redemption instead of Divine Hurricane so that you resurrect after that and you get to take a much better fight right after where all of their resources are already used. With that being said, he does not take that. He ends up going with the Divine Hurricane because they want to set up for really powerful Unspeakable Horrors. And having a 40 second cooldown on Divine Rage, uh, or sorry, Divine Storm, is going to set up for those amazing um, Unspeakable Horrors. So for the rest of this game, they're going to play like pro teams would play. They're going to check bushes with abilities. They are going to play safe. They are waiting for the next objective. They are doing whatever they can to pretty much just kind of sit around. Uh, he does end up going for one stun onto the Imperius, goes for the second stun, and then goes for the Benediction stun as the third one. Unspeakable Horror goes off and applies that uh, those three extra seconds of silence. Those three extra seconds of silence leads to the kill of the Imperius. And now he's just going to go quickly get a stun onto the Chen. Nintori on that amazing Chen pops the barrel, gets out of there alive, but he is able to pop the barrel, which we saw earlier. That barrel almost killed the, the Hanzo and required a, a usage of a medallion to get out. Well, since his medallion's already down, any time that Justin can get an amazing stun, um, they don't need to worry about a barrel. And so that's the best part about this, is that he is doing his best to not only secure kills for his team, but the way that he's playing should also prevent deaths of his team. 
And, uh, and that's what's great about it. So if you can model off of his play style, play very safe in the early game, and then utilize your high CC potential in the mid to late game, uh, you're going to find yourself winning a lot more games than you're losing. Now, as far as Uther main tank in Storm League, I would say use it with caution. Um, it, he works best on very specific maps, and he works best with very specific comps. He really struggles against tanks that can displace him far into the enemy team. For example, like I said, Garrosh, even Diablo flipping and pushing into the team. Uh, and he also struggles against some tanks like ETC who can slide into him and then knock him into the team. The other thing to notice is he has very low health compared to other tanks. At level 22, he's only sitting at 4,685 health, where someone like Imperius is sitting at 5,800 health. A good almost 2,000 health above the Uther. Or I guess only 1,200 health above the Uther. Um, and, and Imperius still has very similar armor, which means that they have... Imperius just purely has about 20% more effective health. On top of that, Imperius has an escape, as we just saw with the spear. Uh, ETC has an escape, Muradin has an escape, almost every other tank has an escape. So, bringing him into Stormly can be a challenge against teams that are more likely to take out your front line, um, which you'll see more and more often the higher rank you are. And my concern is that in the lower rank, by picking Uther as main tank, your team will think that you're trolling, which you're really not, um, but they'll think that you're trolling. So keep that in mind that uh, he can be really good even in Storm League, but there's a lot that I would be concerned about. And again, he uses W to check bushes. He was a little late after the, uh, the Hanzo already checked the bush, but that's perfectly fine. So now we're going to be going up to this objective. Now this objective, both teams are relatively even. They are concerned that the enemy team is going to go for their top keep before the objective because their top keep is rather low. So you, say, you see he's standing in a position where the enemies can't see where he's at because he's behind a wall. Um, and then he's going to go in and he can use his W to check these bushes ahead of time. Um, but in this case, we have the Hanzo who already checks the bush. They go, they push, they destroy the catapult, and they leave. If the catapult's gone, they know they have two waves where they won't need to worry about a catapult pushing their lane. So instead, they start heading to this objective now. And this is the point that the first thing that he needs to do is start applying... Um, his holy shocks and gaining armor. He also can still apply armor over the diva if the diva gets stunned or silenced, but he's going to save his W primarily to save his team from the, uh, the spears, and then he's going to use his Q to heal himself. We have a great spear, and then we have a knockback. Now, he pressed his R before the knockback happened, so you can see that the, the stun didn't end up hitting anyone, and that's just because of some... He was probably mashing the ability when the silence went out, and then, uh, and then he got knocked back by the tracers level 20. And then he's able to eat a few shots for his team. He heals up his team, and this is the other great part about running two supports. If you ever have an awkward fight... You can heal back up your team much faster and get to a, a safer position uh, with two healers. So right here, he could potentially throw off his W or Q to heal instead of do damage. Um, and he does throw just a couple heals onto the D.Va. And now they're in a pretty good position if they want to go back in. And his ult will be back up in 20 seconds. We have the Durins of Hate, which will be back up in 30 seconds. Uh, and he still does have his stuns, which could always be followed up by that... Uh, that Hanzo. It's a good stun to prevent the spear from hitting anyone. In this case, I don't know if it would have hit anyone, but that's still fine. He uses his Q onto the turret just to get a little bit of armor. He uses another W to get more armor, and I think he gets a little concerned that he was going to die there, so he simply just uses the, uh, the stun defensively, but he's also used his Benediction, so he won't have a very long stun, and he doesn't have the stun for Durance of Hate this time. So you see they, instead of fighting and continuously fighting, they decide to wait until his stun is back up. And so they end up going for the turret, and they just need to time this out. So just so you guys know, he has 12 seconds left on Divine Storm. And 
There is 65% left, or sorry, there's 35% left. It counts 2% per second, which means that it will use 24%, and that means they'll still have 10% after his ult is done for them to get back on the point. He decides to pre-tap a fountain, and, and even though he's at full health and almost full mana, what pre-tapping is going to do is it's going to allow him to have a continuous heal over the duration of the fountain, even after he starts taking damage. So he's going to pre-tap this, and they're going to go in, and this is the last fight that they want to take right here. If they can win this fight, they believe that they can end the game, and if the opposing team wins this fight, the opposing team feels like they can win the game. He uses the armor onto the D.Va to give her more time to aggressively hold the point and contest the point. Once again, he's applying his Q for the first time in a long time as a heal uh, to give that 50 armor onto the D.Va as she just got hit by a root. And he's waiting for the best opportunity to land a great stun so that they can use that Durance of Hate. Right here, he ends up overlapping his stuns a little bit. This is a mistake. It could simply be nerves. Remember, this is the last fight of the first week of CCL. And this right here could determine so much of this game. So where he did overlap just a teeny bit, he probably went for the initial stun because he got Junkrat, realized he could get the Imperius as well, and so he ended up going for a Divine Storm. They get stunned long enough to get hit by the Durance of Hate, and then the Durance of Hate is going to keep them silenced long enough for their team to kill two targets, and having two healers, they're able to keep their team alive through the rest of this fight. They can then stay on this point until they win the actual protector, and in many cases, they would end up pushing, destroying the, the walls, and going and closing out this game. He hops out early because he doesn't really want to waste the, the protector and how many stuns he has available, especially since he has Divine Storm soon. They go for a, uh, a stun there, and he kind of wants to go for a second stun. Um, but he wants to wait until the Durance of Hate's back up. You could tell he went for that first stun, and then the other person said, I don't have Durance of Hate, and he goes, oh, okay, I'll wait a second. Um, and again, he gets knocked into here, but he's not really afraid. Uh, he can stun. He, again, doesn't do the double stun here, um, because he was just waiting for that Durance of Hate. Now that Durance is available, he starts off with his big stun, allowing Durance to land onto the Chen. The Chen is then rooted for the rest of this. No time to barrel, no time to drink, and no time to use Stagger. And that is why you use Main Tank Uther. You get the capabilities of a double support. You get the CC of almost better CC than most other tanks in the game. Um, and you get a lot of armor that allows you to survive the bursty environment of competitive Heroes of the Storm. And that is it. So, you can follow Justin. Uh, he has a Twitch channel, This Justing. You can always check that out. You can also follow me anywhere on social media. You can always check the description down below. Um, you can always hit that subscribe, everything else, but this is why Main Tank Uther is being played by the pros these days. Thank you guys so much for watching. My goal throughout CCL is to make why the pros play videos of common heroes that are being used by the pros that maybe are used by the rest of us. And maybe they're not, so we can see why they're used or why they're not used. And I think that this will be a fun series to bring back, and I think it's a great time to bring back this this series. So thank you guys so much for uh, for hanging out, and I think we're uh, we're gonna see a lot of fun coming out from the Heroes of Storm competitive scene uh, over the next week or two, or or it's twelve weeks, right? It's twelve weeks for CCL. Either way, uh, thank you guys so much, and uh, stay tuned for the other videos.